welcome to The Fermented Homestead. If you're new here, my name is Anna, and on this channel, I'm sharing our journey of learning how to turn our home into a homestead. Today, we are covering the topic of fermenting 101. Basically, where I'm gonna go ahead and take you through some of the reasons why, what fermentation is. We're gonna talk about how to ferment and why you wanna ferment. We're kinda just gonna cover a lot of the information behind fermenting. This is not a tutorial on how to ferment, but that will be covered in upcoming videos and we'll be talking about it a little bit. And we'll also be talking about how fermentation works. I'm gonna show you a lot of the tools and the equipment that, are, that you can use in fermenting, a lot of the books that I love that surrounding fermenting. This is kind of just an informational 101 type of video. A couple of weeks ago, I put out a video asking you guys what you wanted to know about fermenting. And it was a long list and I'm so excited to be able to cover it with you guys, but it is a very long video. It is two hours and two and a half hours of me talking and I didn't even scratch the surface of it. So I decided that instead of trying to cut and chop and, and cut this down into like a 20 minute video, I figured that I would go ahead and just cut this into a couple different parts to share with you guys over the next couple weeks. We're gonna cover a lot of topics, but not very deeply because fermenting is a, <laughs> um, Fermenting is a very vast subject, <laughs> one that I'm very passionate about and one that I really hope to kind of figure out. I'm not, I'm not an expert in fermenting. I'm not an expert in microbiology. I'm not an expert in any of that kind of stuff. I am simply somebody who really enjoys fermenting, fermented food, and that's, and we're very curious about the science behind it. So I've just done a lot of research and looking into and have a lot of experience with actually fermenting. So please don't take any of this stuff as gospel. This, I am not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a biologist, I'm none of those things. I'm just somebody who really enjoys finding out information and I'm sharing it with you the best that I know to be the truth. So let's go ahead and cut the chit chat because I do plenty of that later on in this video. And I hope that you guys enjoy this introduction to fermentation. A couple of weeks ago, I reached out and asked you what you wanted to know about fermentation, and I got a tremendous amount of feedback, and I'm so excited to bring you guys as many answers as I possibly can to what you guys wanted to know about fermentation, the very basics of it, how to ferment, what can go wrong, how can I prevent what goes wrong, what do I need, what do I not need, and am I gonna kill anybody? I think, oh, and salt content. So we have a bunch of different things coming up here and I'm going to tell you everything that I possibly can and distill it down into hopefully a short period of time. So the first thing we should start with is probably the basic definition of what fermentation is. And according to Dr. Axe, it is the process of using microorganisms like bacteria and yeast to convert carbohydrates into alcohol or organic acids under anaerobic, which means without oxygen, conditions. There are a ton of different types of ferments. So it's kind of hard to say this is exactly what fermentation is, but there is a basic biological process and that is what I just described. So to put that in a little bit more practical terms, basically fermentation is just taking whatever food you want to ferment, say cabbage or carrots, and we're gonna add salt to it, water if we need it, and we are going to let salt and the lack of oxygen breed bacteria. The bacteria is gonna feed on the sugars that are naturally occurring in that food or the sugars that you add to it and it's gonna convert that sugar into whatever product you need, whether it's alcohol, acetic acid, lactic acid, CO2, whatever its byproduct may be. And the byproduct is the fermentation of that food. And the bacteria is also going to break down the fibers inside of that food to make it a little bit more digestible for you, if that's what you're going for. If you're clicking on this video, you might be new to fermenting and you might not have done it or you're just kind of getting into it. And you might want to know why on earth I would want to take my time and ferment my food. The number one reason is taste because fermented food tastes amazing. It's incredible. It gives it a much more deep depth of flavor. That particular flavor is umami. If you look online, I'll try and find one and put it here. You can see a, a map of your tongue and all the different taste buds that are on your tongue. And those taste buds are laid out in certain order. And basically the, the taste receptors that are in your taste buds, they're for sweet, sour, salty, bitter. I think there might be, um, a, I can't remember the other one but there's also umami. If you have all of those different flavors within the food that you're cooking, fermenting, whatever it might be, if you have all of those flavors, it's like a complete flavor. If you're missing the umami factor, 
it's really missing something. Like, I like to think of umami as completing a flavor, basically. It's almost an indescribable taste. It just makes everything just so much tastier and it's deeper, richer, just amazing flavor. Fermenting foods will pre-digest the food that you are eating. If you have issues with digesting cabbage, for example, if you ferment it and make it into sauerkraut, it's gonna be much easier for your body to digest. And not to mention the fact, if you do ferment that, you will begin to slowly inoculate your body, your digestive tract, with the bacteria that you need in the future to break down that cabbage on its own. When you are introducing cat, when you're introducing bacteria with fermentation into your body, it's usually what they call transient bacteria, and it usually just moves right through you. But that's not to say that it doesn't do good while it's inside of your body. And if you are inoculating yourself with enough bacteria that can do certain things, certain bacteria can do certain different things. And if you, if you inoculate yourself with that bacteria for a certain period of time, if you're fighting off some kind of a sickness, you can, ing you can ingest the certain kind of bacteria that is going to help you to fight off whatever sickness that is. Something that is gonna improve your immune system, which pretty much all of them do that. <laughs> Fermentation, it actually and like scientifically makes you happier. <laughs> the concentration of Morganella bacteria inside of your gut is a direct link to depression and inflammation. Depressed people have a stronger immune responses from the chemical that is exuded, exuded, excreted, whatever you wanna call it, produced by the Morganella bacteria and other gram-negative bacteria that is in your gut. There's gram-negative and gram-positive. Gram-negative is bad, gram-positive is good, so it's pretty easy to remember. The good bacteria are the things that you want to increase, the things that you want to culture, the things that you want to increase in the foods that you eat and your body. The gram-negative ones, they're never gonna go away. You can't get rid of them, especially not the ones in your body, but if you increase the gram positive ones, you can decrease the gram negative ones and then the, the positive ones win. That's kind of how it works in a very simplified nutshell. When you ferment foods, you also increase several of the different vitamins and minerals that are in several of the different vitamins, I should say. I don't know about the minerals, um, but it increases the vitamin C content. For example, if you ferment sauerkraut, I know I talk a lot about sauerkraut, but sauerkraut's amazing and it's my favorite ferment, so it tends to be the one that I tend to look up a lot. Fermenting sauerkraut, at the right time, the right, you know, all the right temp um, all of the right conditions, it can increase the vitamin C content of regular cabbage 700%. It also increases many of the different B vitamins that are in your foods. It does this by making things more bioavailable that are already in it, but it's also oftentimes can be a byproduct of the bacteria itself. And it's also been shown to increase the bioavailability of both zinc and mm. iron. Fermenting foods can also reduce the naturally occurring nitrates and oxalic acid that is in the food and biodegrades certain pesticide resi residue within your foods as well, or, or whatever, the, the pesticide, pesticide residue that can be in and on your food. So if you are unable to purchase organic produce and it's something that you know is possibly sprayed, if you wanna reduce the pesticide content or the pesticide load that may be on your foods, ferment it and the bacteria will do its chomping away on the foods that, you're, that you are fermenting. I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy on you guys for just a second and I wanna tell you some of the actual, like the internal health benefits that can come from eating fermented foods. Fermenting foods can help to activate both your innate immune system as well as your adaptive immune system. You have two different types of immune systems within your body that work separately but together. And fermenting foods can activate both of them and help them work together better. The innate immune system is what you're born with. It is your, it's your organs, it's your, um, just your general immune system. It's, it's the thing, things that are actually your body that that can fight any kind of illness or any kind of uh, any kind of things from the outside that might affect you. As time goes on, your innate immune system, the more things that it's exposed to, the more things that it has an opportunity to, uh, to fight, it will create antibodies and it will create memories to help your adaptive immune system be able to take over as you age. Because as you age, your immune system will begin to slowly start to shift from innate immune system to um, adaptive immune system. 
And as you get old, you're not gonna have much of an innate immune system and you have to rely very heavily on your adaptive immune system. And so fermenting foods can really help to activate both of those. So the way that fermenting is able to activate both the innate as well as the adaptive immune systems is by activating immunoglob um, uh, immunoglobulin A, which is IgA, is an antibody blood protein that is part of your immune system. Your body makes IgA and other type of antibodies to help fight off sickness. IgA is found in the mucous membranes, mainly in the respiratory and digestive tracts, and is also found in saliva, tears, and breast milk. A deficiency seems to play a part in asthma and allergies. Researchers have also linked IgA deficiencies to autoimmune health problems. So it's a pretty big one. It also activates macrophages. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it is the type of white blood cell of the immune system that engulfs and digests anything that does not have on its surface proteins that are specific to healthy blood cells, including cancer and microbes. So basically, if your body gets invaded by these things that are bad, the microphages are gonna attack it and eat it. Pretty cool, huh? And it also increases lymphocytes and which are white blood cells produced by the bone marrow that are able to remember antigens and provoke your body's immune, immune response. So basically this is what is, it's almost like a trigger for your immune system, uh, these lymphocytes. If they see something, they're gonna give up the flags and tell you know, your immune system, hey, it's time to start fighting. It also helps with your dendritic cells, which are responsible for your body's adaptive immune response and act as messengers between your adaptive and your innate immune systems. So you can kind of see how all of these different things within the fermented foods kind of brings together your immune system and activates it and helps it talk to one another. I hope that wasn't going too far with it, but I was really intrigued and interested by how these things work. And I wanted to kind of give you at least kind of a surface view of how these things work into the actual fermenting prop parts. There's three basic types of ferments. There's more than that, but there's three basic uh, products of fermentation. There's lactic acid, alcohol or ethanol, and acetic acid, which is vinegar. The lactic acid is the main one that we do on this channel. It's the main one in pretty much everything. Lactic acid is like the big, big one. And that one's produced by lactobacillus bacteria. There's a bunch of different ones. Alcohol is produced by the removal of air. Like if you're gonna put an airlock on something so that only that can breathe out, but nothing can get in, it's basically you, you cut off the oxygen to like a fermented liquid, and then that will start to produce the alcohol. When you add the air to it, you take the lid off. You accidentally leave the top off of a fermented bottle of wine. It's gonna turn to vinegar. So when you add the air to it, it turns it into various types of vinegars. That's why Oftentimes when you're fermenting vinegars and stuff like that, you'll start capping it off and then at a certain point you'll take the cap off and just cover it with something breathable so it can get the air to it. And that's to turn the alcohol into uh, vinegar. One of the questions that I got was how do you take a, a vinegar that, tur that turned to wine and turned into vinegar? Just expose it to air. Maybe you're wondering how on earth does fermentation work? And I'm gonna give you a really simple, simple kind of guide for how that process works and it's basically the bacteria and or yeast you can use there can be both that is either present on the foods that you're fermenting or that you add at the correct stage of the fermentation and that bacteria and yeast will eat the carbohydrates or the sugar that is in that food beverage sugar whatever it may be the the, the sugar is the food for the bacteria and it turns that into the proper byproduct whether that be is lactic acid acetic acid ethanol carbon dioxide, whatever whatever the proper byproduct is for that bacteria or yeast. And there's also mold fermentations like koji and things like that, but that's one I haven't really quite mastered the science behind, so I'm gonna kind of talk about that a little bit, but not overwhelmingly. We're kind of mostly focusing on like the acid type ferments. The, the process of fermentation also breaks down the fibers that are present in the food. The human digestive tract, the, the fibers and things, I think it's the insoluble fibers cannot actually on our own, like not like our own workings of our body, like our own intestines, cannot actually digest these insoluble fibers. Those are actually food for the bacteria, part of the food that are for the bacteria. When you consume those foods, the bacteria is gonna go to a town on those fibers and start to break them down, and that's how it's able to make it so that it's easier to digest for you. It'll also convert the sugars, some of them like with miso, it will convert the complex carbohydrates into simple carbohydrates and make them much easier for your body to absorb. Most good bacteria take over and survive, 
th survive, thrive and survive without exposure to oxygen. And that's called an anaerobic environment. And so oddly enough, the good bacteria is they don't want the, ba the air and they, they really like a higher salt. I don't know if they really like so much as they will survive in a higher salt environment, whereas the bad bacteria will not survive with, expo with lack of oxygen and exposure to, to uh, salt. Lactic acid can be created with or without exposure to oxygen as long as the actual food is not exposed to the oxygen. So basically, if you're trying to ferment sauerkraut, you're going to make sure to hold the all the cabbage underneath the brine, usually with a weight or something like that. And if, if you keep it underneath the brine level, it really can't survive underneath that brine. It's just, it's not the, the it's not the right environment for the bad type of bacteria to be able to really take over and populate. The only really accept, real exception that I'm aware of to the lack of oxygen is botulism. And that is the thing that everybody's scared of when it comes to fermentation and uh, canning. We'll cover this one a little bit later. That one does survive in a with a lack of oxygen. However, it cannot survive in a high acid environment. So when you're fermenting, the goal is to get the acid, the pH level low enough that, which is, I think it's 4.7 or below is the, 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 the pH level that back to botulism cannot survive in. So it can survive without the oxygen, but it cannot survive in the high acid environment. And then alcohol, like I said earlier, requires a lack of oxygen to become alcohol. And then in order to turn that into vinegar, you just add the oxygen to it. The salt is a really, really important part of the fermentation process because the salt is able to inhibit the bad bacterial growth through what's called os osmotic shock. And what that does is it draws water out of the microbial cells via osmosis. And basically that's just the transfer of liquid through a semi-permeable surface basically like skin and it kills those microbes basically like a water vampire vampire without teeth it just sucks all the water out of them so they can't survive i think it just it maybe it just comes down to strains and types of different bacteria as to why one one survives and one dies i haven't figured that part out yet but i just know it exists i hope that you enjoyed this part of the fermenting 101 video make sure that you stay tuned for future episodes where we're going to be talking even further about fermenting we're going to be talking about all kinds of tools and equipment whys hows what's and how to's so make sure you stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up. It helps with all the algorithmic googly stuff. And if you're new around here, make sure you hit this subscribe button. We're gonna be talking about all things fermentation in a lot more detail. And then up here, check out this video. This is one that Mr. Google Pants thinks you're gonna enjoy. This is gonna be one of my fermenting videos that I think you're gonna enjoy. And then up here, make sure you check out my fermenting playlist. Make sure that you guys stick around in the coming weeks for all the future different parts of this video.